Effects Surveillance Program, we work with our state partners, um, the Florida Birth Effects Registry, um, which, which does a lot of epidemiologic surveillance. Really the main function of the, um, the PDFP is to um, uh, help with um, um, surveillance with the birth effects registry, making sure that we um, passive and active surveillance, and I'll go into that. Um, but we do also have a little bit of, uh, provide a little bit of support for education, access to services, um, and hopefully uh, we also work alongside clinicians to um, hopefully our data can impact clinical care. Um, let's go to the next slide. This tells a little bit more. Um, Birth effects really impact about one in every 33 births in the U.S. You probably know that, but um, one in 28 in Florida. And there are about 41 states that track birth effects in some way, um, but around 14 who are supported by the CDC, um, CDC funding to manage these population-based registries. Um, so I'm going to start with the big picture and then zoom in on families. Um, so these registries, including ours, um, really um, track about 50 different conditions, you know, syndromes, chromosomal anomalies, and you know, various um, uh, conditions impacting heart, brain, limbs, gastrointestinal, abdominal wall, uh, including clots. Um, so uh, Florida is the fourth most populous state in the country with about 225,000 births every year. So it's a big registry and it's a big state, um, a lot to track. And we uh, essentially compile the records, uh, birth and death biostatistics records, um, combine those with our ACA healthcare data, which includes um, hospital discharge, emergency room and outpatient care, and our regional, regional perinatal intensive care centers, our RIPIC centers. So those are the data that um, kind of contribute to this registry. And for some of our years, we have um, early intervention, children's medical services data. Um, so it's a passive registry where all of this information gets compiled and we have um, basically information about any child born in our state with any of these conditions. Um, we also do a little bit of active surveillance, which means go out and actually check those records to make sure that um, the case is in fact a case. So I wanted to start with a registry because it's really only as good as how timely, how complete, how accurate it is. And that gives us a bird's eye view of um, how many cases and the trends, uh, the prevalence of different conditions in our state. Um, that's a big piece of what we do. Um, and then we, we can look at risk factors. We can look at patterns and prevalence. We can look at services access and utilization and costs and things like that to help ultimately plan for services. Um, a small piece of what we do in addition is um, to um, some community-based research. So we're interested in not just assessing the prevalence of these conditions, but to look at um, the services and supports for families who are, um, have children born with these conditions. And that's, um, that's the piece I'm going to talk about today. So next slide. Okay. So, um, so from the EPI side, again, it's a lot of the registry, um, making sure that it's accurate. Um, some environmental studies, some specific projects looking at specific conditions, and most recently is our, um, uh, uh, they've included some um, surveillance of neonatal abstinence syndrome, even though that's not a birth defect, it's something that we're really following in Florida, as well as um, our team here created that um, Zika pregnancy registry. Um, as far as community-based research, um, we're also working with NAS, with Zika System of Care, um, but I want to tell the story today about our family experiences surveys and how those came about. Um, because uh, we, we want to kind of follow the after story of what happens with families um, from the moment that the child's diagnosed and how they um, navigate Florida's systems of care. Um, our website is there on the, on the page too so you can read a little bit more about us. 
Um, so let's, um, yeah, let's move forward. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and I'm going to talk about basically AIM-3, which is how we use our surveillance data and then connect to this access to healthcare services. Um, when I talk about, uh, you can go to the next slide, actually. Um, or a FASA class, I'm going to start with our study that we did um, actually about four years ago, five years ago, we started actually with Down syndrome because it's one of the um, relatively more common birth defects. It's more, uh, relatively more well known among all those conditions that we track and it has medical and social and developmental implications. And so we really wanted to understand families' experiences in accessing services and we did um, a number of focus groups with parents and providers to ask about services in the first three years of the child's life. And what the families talked with us about was their experience in receiving their child's first diagnosis. That's, that's really um, where their story began and kind of continued from there throughout their child's prognosis, throughout their lifespan. <laughs> Um, so that really helped us understand parents' views. Um, what we decided to do from that study was create a survey that really followed the journey of parents prenatally throughout childhood and see what lessons could be learned about um, the system of care for Down syndrome. And then this past year, um, we adapted that survey for parents of children with orofacial class for some of the same reasons. Uh, relatively more common than some of the other conditions, has developmental, social, and medical implications, and it's one of those um, kind of uh, conditions that maybe we can have some actionable um, improvements we can make to the system. So, okay. Um, I wanted to share with this um, study, I have a wonderful team of masters and doctoral students here in public health. Um, we have one physician from Nigeria. We have um, th three dentists from India, one who is here joining us. And we have one parent of a child with chronic complex conditions. So this is our team that meets with families to um, distribute the survey and to help them complete that survey. Okay, all right, go ahead. Next slide. Um, so I am by no means an expert in oral facial class, um, nor am I a physician, um, but I'm a public health systems researcher. Um, so I'm just going to give a little background on um, oral facial class just to provide some context before I talk about the family experiences study. Um, so clefts occur when that uh, boundary between the nasal and oral cavities or the roof of the the oral cavity are incompletely formed in um, four to ten weeks after conception. And um, go ahead and flip through the slides. I'll keep you busy here. <laughs> okay. Um, and a lot of times, um, some might perceive that it's just a simple surgical repair, um, and that's all that's needed. But in addition to a lot of times these co-occurring conditions, um, such as hearing problems, there might just be, even with an isolated class, there can be comorbidities. Um, so um, associated complications with a class, such as feeding or speech problems. And this is really important because in, in infancy, um, especially that first few, three months of life, the fourth trimester, um, a lot of um, development in an early childhood. Brain development is happening, the foundations of our sensory systems, um, developmental processes, feeding and speech um, specifically, are, it's all forming within the brain. And um, the hospitalizations, the medical procedures, the feeding challenges, all of these different um, things you see on this slide here can impact many aspects of development. So it becomes more complicated, as you'll see, than, um, than some might perceive when they're, when they're thinking about class. Okay, next slide. So, um, so this is just a couple of slides about the prevalence um, of oral facial class. So it's about 12 per 10,000 births. 
Um, so about 4,400 babies born each year in the U.S. In the next slide. And then in Florida, um, again, um, the, about the same rates. Um, and the most common are isolated cleft palate um, or clefless, and then sometimes we have both. Um, so these are just the rates and, um, and the prevalence of each of those. Go to the next slide. Um, I did want to mention the, um, the cause of the clefts is um, it's, it's multifactorial. It is not one specific cause, um, but uh, it could include smoking, diabetes, certain medications, could be part of other conditions, and um, non-Hispanic white mothers have the highest prevalence rate. You can see that here. Okay. But um, I'm not really here to talk so much about trends and prevalence of clefts, but about um, what happens next. We really wanted to know descriptively, qualitatively, what families' experiences are in terms of the services and the supports um, in Florida. And we're using a framework um, called Family-Centered Care which probably many on the call are familiar with. Okay. So um, why don't we just go to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit about the survey and family-centered care for anyone who's not necessarily familiar with it. Um, so this is an approach. Family-centered care is an approach to planning and delivering and evaluating health services. Um, it's grounded in this mutually beneficial partnership between parents or caregivers, families, and healthcare providers. And um, so it's really a way of describing the relationship among providers and families. Um, and we've made some progress in, in, in contributing or kind of developing systems that are family-centered, um, but we still have a lot of uh, long ways to go. Um, so, uh, so really, family-centered care provide, um, respects the role that families play in uh, ensuring the health and well-being of their children and acknowledge that the emotional and so social and developmental support is an integral part of, of health care. Um, so as I mentioned before, especially in early childhood, we can't separate health and development, and that's something we want to consider. Um, so the family-centered care framework shapes policy programs, design of facilities, um, staff, day-to-day -day interactions with patients. Um, okay, go to the next slide. Um, and it's specifically, family-centered care is really useful as a framework when you're talking about children and youth with special health care needs because this population has a lot more interaction with health care systems. Um, utilize a lot more health services, and it's really been found in some studies to be, um, to contribute this approach to more efficient use of services, more satisfaction with services and utilization and follow-up, um, communication, and ultimately outcomes for kids. So, um, so for the context of this study, we really believe that this family-centered approach um, beginning with family-centered prenatal care would, exist, would consist of early and regular appointments, um, really good, clear, accurate communication about testing options and recommendations, risks that results are delivered in this sensitive manner in a family's primary language by a consistent provider and a culturally competent provider. So there's an example. Um, so family-centered prenatal care could result in earlier recognition, diagnosis, quicker linkage to services, and greater satisfaction with those services and participation. Um, and so uh, continuing on with that, uh, receiving that prenatal diagnosis is helpful and also having a, a positive birth hospital experience or primary care provider experience, again, can help families um, learn about and actually utilize those supports and services that are available, such as early intervention or therapy support groups. So hopefully I've convinced you and we can move to the next slide. All right, so um, very simply, um, I describe family-centered care 
And this is the framework that you'll see these concepts repeated as I go through the, the primary preliminary results of the study um, to kind of four main components. So the first is information sharing. So that's clear, complete, unbiased um, information about um, the child's condition and the services available. Um, and so that parents can, can engage in informed decision making. The second component at the top there is dignity and respect. So thinking about sensitivity to families, cultural competence again, recognizing and um, respecting families' um, knowledge that they have, their values, their beliefs, their cultural backgrounds. The third component is participation. And we think about that as team care in which the family is part of that care team, that medical care team. Um, and so we encourage and support families in being uh, part of that decision-making team at the level that they're comfortable with. And then the last part at the bottom is collaboration. So we have information, dignity and respect or sensitivity, participation, and at the bottom, collaboration I describe as a family-friendly system of care. So really thinking about our policies and our programs and our healthcare delivery um, that's family-friendly. And the only way to know that is by including families in our evaluation of our programs and our development of our programs. Okay, next slide. Okay, so you're probably wondering when I'm going to get to this study, but now's the time. So, um, so we, uh, we developed this study, um, again, to just understand about the care and the services that are received among families of children with clefts um, who are born in Florida to kind of look at family-centeredness of care in these different settings and that will help us to come up with some ideas for improving service delivery. And, um, and we did um, make some changes after our um, family experiences survey was distributed with families who had children with Down syndrome. We kind of did some things uh, statewide to support, better support families. So we're hoping the results of this study will again um, kind of promote some change statewide. Next slide. Okay, so this survey um, has been, uh, will be, or is being distributed throughout Florida um, through craniofacial clinics, support groups, therapy programs, um, dental offices, healthcare providers. It's really available to any family who has a child under the age of 18 that's been diagnosed with a cleft lip or cleft palate or both. Um, Primarily, at this point, we've been distributing it through our children's medical services clinics. And so the CMS, um, we have a CMS, Children's Medical Services Network, statewide. And that uh, is a system of care, healthcare providers, care coordination, um, and clinics across, around the state. Primarily, it's for families who, um, who qualify financially, so most are Medicaid. Um, eligible and have um, one of these qualifying conditions, chronic or complex conditions, um, pre-existing conditions. And so I just want to note from here on out, right now, um, most of our respondents have been a clinical sample from CMS um, clinics in this region. So you can see a, a picture here of some of our staff in the waiting room of our, one of our CMS clinics um, getting ready to meet the families as they come in. So I just wanted to start with that by saying um, some of the res res results so far um, are really from families who are receiving services in a pretty coordinated craniofacial clinic, a one-stop shop, um, which is a model that we really promote. Um, that you will see in a moment here, yeah, still, um, they still have some needs and some concerns that, um, that I think we could, we could take these lessons um, to your state and across our own state. Okay, next. So the survey itself um, it contains these uh, constructs of family-centered care. That's how the questions are, are worded and what's included, asking about care coordination and transition 
um, any, um, some of the questions were worded based on the National Survey of Children with Special Health Care Needs. They've perfected that survey, so we use some of the same wording. Um, and it has these um, six sections. And so again, these sections kind of follow the family's journey, beginning with prenatal care, the childbirth setting, um, usually the hospital, uh, but it could be a birth center. Um, their access to primary care and specialty care, and then uh, early childhood and school experiences and family stress and support. Okay, next. Um, the survey is available online and in paper, and like I said, a lot of the times we have found uh, being in the clinic and, and helping families fill it out in person is the best way, um, but that's pretty, pretty labor intensive. Um, out of 91 caregivers who have accessed the survey, we've had 67 who have eligible and completed it thus far. So we just started this past year, this year, um, attending the clinics and distributing this survey. Um, it's available in English and Spanish, um, as I mentioned before, and I'm going to go from here on out talk about these first 67 respondents. Our population in Florida is um, pretty diverse. About a quarter of our population is Hispanic, and our Hispanic population is quite diverse in and of itself. Um, about 12 to 16 percent of our population is, is black. So, and again, our black population is pretty diverse too. Um, so we always look at that when we um, distribute surveys and make sure that we, um, we have a representative sample. As I mentioned earlier, clefts are more common among white non-Hispanic families um, or children. Um, but we want to, so we want to make sure that we actively recruit these underrepresented voices as well. Um, you can see here the age range is from three months to 16 years. And again, this is really a qualitative, broad snapshot of a family's experiences, and we really found um, that having that range helps us to kind of see where the services might drop off. Uh, so we learned some lessons there from our last survey. Um, and then you can see the income is kind of skewed here towards the lower income because, again, a lot of the, the respondents to this survey um, majority of them are part of that craniofacial class. Okay, next slide. Okay. So, so let's walk through this journey in terms of the results that we have so far. Um, so the beginning is um, with prenatal care, I would say that's one entry point to services. Um, so family-centeredness or sensitivity of care is helpful in encouraging um, you know, the screening, of course, diagnosis, and also follow-up if there are concerns. And most of the respondents so far had a prenatal provider and most had a, a fairly positive experience. Um, so that's, uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, we also ask um, about the birth setting. So as you can see here, out of these first set of respondents, about half the child was diagnosed um, prenatally, so think about our prenatal providers, but the other half received that diagnosis at or shortly after birth. So that's another setting and another entry point for services. Um, the, the responses don't always add up to 67 because some people didn't, uh, we didn't force response to all these questions. Um, and the timing of the diagnosis is something, too, that we sometimes might take for granted, but it's important. So one quote here is from an adoptive parent um, who learned um, about the child's condition and from the CMS nurse. And then the second quote is from a parent whose child is, uh, the cleft palate was identified about three days postpartum. And so again, we think about the, the implications of that. Um, the chart here is that answers the question about who provided information to the family about oral facial clefts in the birth setting, I think is really something that um, we've been really interested in. Um, so you can see here with clefts, the most commonly reported answer was surgeon. Um, and then you can see for 10 of the respondents, the answer was none. 
Um, for our survey, our Down syndrome survey, the most common response when we asked about whether they received information at the birth setting about Down syndrome, the most common response was none, followed by the nurse. And so we are really working with hospitals to understand that system and to provide some support and guidance in terms of um, how to get good, um, solid uh, information to families' hands, the types of information that they need and want at that time, and figure out who's the best person to deliver that information. Next slide. So, um, so parents had um, responded so far that they do want information about the causes the prevention of, this, of their child's condition um, or future recurrence of the condition. They wanted information on parent-to-parent -parent support and on available services. Next slide. And also, um, about half of the children were admitted to NICU, and then the other half were in the regular mother-baby unit. So that's something else that we've considered is that these are two different environments, two different systems of care um, often, and they have different entry points to services. Um, so most of the respondents had a, a, a positive, sensitive, positive experience. I'm just sharing snapshots, snippets of our results here. Um, but you can see that many did not, and there are quotes here about um, the the, the stress and the challenges in the hospital setting um, in terms of having um, a really positive, supportive, family-centered response to that diagnosis. So again, I think there's um, a lot of work that could be done to improve um, this, this kind of touch point along the way. Okay, next. So once the child is, um, is discharged from the hospital and the family goes home, the next step I would say on this journey um, to consider is medical home. Um, primary pediatric care, which again is really helpful in coordinating medical services, supporting families, and once, once uh, the baby's out of the hospital. And a knowledgeable pediatrician for any of these conditions, but especially for clefts, can be really helpful when issues arise. And, in, and for the, the um, pediatrician to be able to tailor that anticipatory guidance to the family and child's needs regarding feeding, development, parenting, um, as well as hopefully developmental screening and monitoring as the child grows. Um, so you can see a quote here, one parent said that they're um, they were offered a variety of options on feeding and bottles and discovered that the bottle worked best several months later through the advice of the pediatrician. So they're really working with the family throughout. Okay, next. So, so there is a primary care provider, hopefully, that's knowledgeable, that's sensitive, um, that's available to that family. And um, depending on the condition, that might take some searching. Um, and it's really helpful to have that medical home because in addition to that, these families are really um, having to um, coordinate a lot of specialty services, and medical services. So you can see here um, on this chart that parents of a child with um, um, oral facial clefts may need to be provide, uh, prepared to have a lot of interaction with healthcare providers. So you can see the list here. And the box shows those um, services that were most common in the first six months, which is a really busy time for infant development and, uh, and of course, for parenting, even under the most ideal circumstances. Okay. So we do have some systems of care that are designed to support families whose children have um, a variety of medical or developmental needs. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. but um, um, So I mentioned that most of the respondents of this survey so far, here's 55 that were, are enrolled in children's medical services, 
Um, but we also look for our IDEA funded special education programs of which these children um, would likely be eligible. And so um, that for birth to three would be our, our Part C early intervention program, we call early step, um, or uh, for children age three and up, um, the school district special education services Part B. Um, so those are, um, we see under enrollment um, in, in the IDEA funded special education programs across the board, and that's no exception here, um, but that's a free resource for families um, if they're able to enroll and hear about it and enroll um, as soon as possible, especially considering speech and feeding therapies. Um, another um, resource, which I, I consider one of the best kept secrets is um, perinatal home visiting. So yes, I, disclaimer, I am an, an evaluator for our state's home visiting program, but I just wanted to point that out here that that's a really great source of prenatal and postpartum support for families across the board. It's conveniently at home. It's often very culturally competent um, and family-centered, it's a close relationship and very holistic. So it can address all of the mothers and the family's needs through connection to other services. Um, so we also look for um, home visiting uh, enrollment here. The other system of care, of course, is um, access to health care coverage and health insurance, um, which we would probably need to spend another hour on that, but we won't. <laughs> um, but again, I would, I would argue that's not a very family-friendly system and it's changing all the time. Um, but you can see here, um, most of the families that we've connected with um, have medical insurance, but we're connecting with them through healthcare providers. So we really are gonna cast a much wider net in trying to reach more families to fill out this survey because it's not really representative of the picture out there. Um, so um, so a, a, one of the parents talked here about CMS and just being on Medicaid and the constraints that that brings and the resources that that brings. Okay, next slide. Um, so you saw the big list of services that, um, that families um, need to access for their children. Um, care coordination, um, it's present for a lot of um, families who are enrolled in CMS program um, because there is a nurse care coordinator that helps with navigating insurance and also navigating referrals to all of these other health care providers. Um, but in general, care coordination support is hard to come by. Um, if someone's enrolled in early intervention um, program, they can get that support too. Um, but you can see from the quotes here how parents talk about as a parent, it's really up to them ultimately to, na to um, navigate all of these medical appointments and it can be really a full-time job. And so I just wanted to point out that these multidisciplinary clinics can be a real godsend because um, they're, um, all the providers are working together, they can coordinate appointments and have it be a combined appointment. Um, but these, these multidisciplinary clinics are sometimes few and far between. Okay. Next slide. Um, we also do ask about transitions, like care coordination is something that helps when we trans transition um, children or families from one setting to another, hospital to home, for example, um, from one provider to another, and from one system to another. If you think of early intervention, birth to three, to a special education system where that's separated out from medical care, um, those, are, those are big shifts and big transitions. So transition planning and support is a family-centered practice and I think it's under-resourced and probably underutilized. Um, so that's what this question is asked about. Next. Um, we also do ask about um, childhood experiences um, and kind of the broader viewpoint. Um, and so again, you might think that a cluster care might be, um, or just those early services would be enough, um, but some of the impacts can be longer lasting than we might think. And so 
this survey, uh, so far the respondents have, have prompted us to really consider the services, support, systems of care, um, being sensitive to the fact that these are ongoing. Um, so, uh, so there could be lingering effects from um, early surgeries or hospitalizations or kind of the early impacts on the child's development and growth, as you can see here in these quotes. Next. Um, and along that same vein, um, we asked about social acceptance. This was part of the Down syndrome survey. We kept it in there, and I was really surprised and dismayed to see that um, to, that this wasn't 100 percent of perceived social acceptance. And it, you know, as we know, the more visible a disability is or a condition is, often they are met with higher stigmatization. And so, um, so this is something that parents are grappling with, and it's certainly going to impact their, um, their outcomes and their, their um, access and utilization of different types of services and support. Okay, next slide. This slide just talks about child care and respite. Um, but we do ask in the survey about parents' stressors. We ask about their levels of financial, emotional, and scheduling stress. And then we ask about different sources of support. So I just wanted to point out here that it's not, um, there's not a lot of consistency in terms of who these supports are for families, and that's no exception with this survey. Um, so the slide here talks about child care, but overall families might rely on more informal support, maybe a spouse or another family member or friends, but others, others may rely primarily on formal support. And so we really need to have, um, be able to provide access to both of those depending on the situation. And those supports really help with accessing information, financial and logistical assistance, and of course emotional support. And social support really um, can be helpful in um, helping parents to keep appointments, adhere to treatment plans, um, and overall kind of keep supporting their child through the, through the process. Next. Okay. Um, so the, the, the formal and informal support, what we've learned um, through our past five years of different research studies is that parent-to-parent -parent support is really paramount. It's really helpful. Um, compared to our work with Down syndrome, um, this has been very different. So in terms of Down syndrome, there's a very strong parent network and parent support presence um, online and in person in many communities. But there's not so much as of a cohesive parent network for oral facial clefts. And considering all of the issues that we just um, kind of reviewed in this study, there's room, I think, again, to improve here. Um, so one example is our, our hospital, All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg has a craniofacial clinic. They also have a large and active parent support group um, affiliated with it. So, um, so most of the respondents in this survey had an access support group, um, but they've relied on um, the nurse or their care coordinator or someone else to, to um, support them um, with information. Next. So these all contribute to um, families' um, attitudes toward their child's prognosis. Um, and how they feel about the future, which can increase or hinder um, the efforts, these tremendous efforts that are needed to manage and coordinate children's care. Um, so as a respondent so far, there were many who felt pretty positive, but again, we were um, sad to see that, that over a third, um, just in this preliminary sample, reported some major concerns about the future and worries about the future. So. Uh, um, so keeping this long-term view, I think, is really helpful and important in that continuity. Um, so the concerns are really related to um, continuing other medical conditions, um, the aforementioned lack of social acceptance or perceived social acceptance, 
and um, these ongoing uh, lingering speech or learning problems that might have stemmed from those early complications. Next slide. Okay, so um, so I hope this gave you a little bit of insight from parents so far um, into the needs and challenges and opportunities for caring for children and families with quests. Um, the family center care framework, as you can see, it kind of helps us to guide um, improvements in quality of life for individuals with disabilities and specifically through class throughout the lifespan beginning prenatally. And that next slide. Um, so what we hope is that the findings, um, once we've, we've uh, completed or uh, received as much more respondents, um, will be used to identify some areas of strengths and gaps in these formal and informal systems, and also to improve how healthcare is delivered and uh, professional practice in medical and educational and community settings. Um, the next slide I'll show you here. Um, it's probably hard to see, but we can probably send these out. Um, this is the brochure at the top that we pilot tested and we developed. And um, it went through, here we go, um, our state clearance process, which took about six months. <laughs> um, so all the lead agencies in the state from our early intervention programs, our home visiting programs, um, Medicaid, Children's Medical Services. Um, so it was vetted by all the agencies um, and it was designed by families um, to be available as a one-page nice brochure that could be distributed um, to all of the hospitals in the state. So we have um, our first 5,000 copies are being distributed now. So that our hope is that at the very least, um, each family who has a child born in this state with any condition, including class, has access to um, the sections in this brochure uh, begin with parent-to-parent -parent support, um, good um, quality information about the child's condition, reliable sources of information, and then access to medical and also developmental or educational services. Um, so that's what the brochure includes. And then we also have a resource guide that we distribute um, this uh, separated regionally um, by various and also by various conditions, including sections on the orofacial class um, throughout the state. And that has uh, medical, educational, recreational, and family supports in it. So that's what we've done so far um, in response to what we've learned from families through the survey. Um, but like I said, we're just hoping to collect more responses and a more diverse um, set of responses to the survey so that we can um, kind of share the findings from that to inform our students. I think that's our last slide. Yeah. So I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. That was really interesting. It's um, there are some similarities here in West Virginia. We've been. I don't know if you have it on. There's been um, some. I posted just a little bit of West Virginia questions under chat in your upper right hand corner. If you if you click it. Oh you yes. Okay. Look at that. Some of it's just kind of throwing it out there, like your home visitation comment. We have right from the start, and that has some compliments. And then I was asking a question about our birth defects. I saw Salem on here. Um, mm -hmm. She might have some questions, but. Um, does anyone have any, I don't want to monopolize, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Marshall? I think um, someone who I don't think is on the call, um, Lori, in our um, Path for Parents program, I think she would be really interested in what you've done um, mm -hmm. in Salem's part of that. My question to you, and you kind of spoke to this a little bit, is you know we have a lot of rural areas, and um, clinics are our main point of entry, like you said, the clinical base either for the survey or the services. But what do you do? Do you have plans for reaching um, parents and families outside of the clinic? And if so, what would what might that be? And then do you think their responses would be any different? Yes, um, so um, so first of all, I neglected to mention that this state-based registry, we literally have a list 
of every child born with a cleft lip and or palate in our state for the past eight years. But that registry is used only to track um, prevalence and trends. And for epidemiologic research, we are not allowed to contact families on that registry. It's not used for re other research purposes. Um, it's really used for surveillance and prevention. So, um, so, that's, so that makes it uh, kind of challenging. Um, and the, what we were really surprised by and kind of learned through our, our efforts to disseminate this survey is, again, as I mentioned, with some conditions, there are strong parent networks or family support networks, and with others, maybe more rare conditions, or the, as we've learned with PLUS, there's not a lot of um, family networks. Um, so it's a little bit harder to, um, to reach families um, besides through um, medical settings, but our, our healthcare system is really fragmented too. We have a lot of, of dental providers, for example. So, um, and our early intervention programs statewide, they don't collect specific data. They can't just pull a list of families who have children with plus because they, 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 don't, they don't collect their data that way. So it's really challenging to work within the existing system beyond children's medical services. Um, we have families, even here in Hillsborough County, who drive, um, or across the state, who drive four to six hours once a year to Jacksonville to go to a multidisciplinary clinic for Down syndrome. When we have all the providers right here in town, but they don't necessarily work together um, to create a multidisciplinary clinic. So one thing I would say for families, you know, across your state, if we don't have, you know, sometimes there's regionalization of specialty services and families can travel to get those, um, those services. And like I said, even here in Florida, families travel across the state to try to get some sort of coordinated care. Um, but really, we'd want to continue to promote that model where providers can work together uh, to create these multidisciplinary clinics, these one-stop shops for families, mm -hmm. um, and then they don't need to—they don't need to go to five appointments a week. They can go kind of periodically and get all their consultation at once. So I don't know if that helps a little bit. Um, I, I, you asked about this the sample so far. This would be our best case scenario sample. Um, these are families. Majority of the families who've responded are in those those um, supported clinics. Um, so as we move out from that, um, I think the story is going to get um, much, much more challenging, actually, and we'll, we'll really learn a lot more about what families are dealing with. Okay. I see Russell and Salem are making comments. You guys were muted before. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to make any comments, feel free. I didn't have any questions. I was just commenting on we have some of the similar issues that she was talking about with the birth defects registry. We also cannot use that data for referrals. We can only use it for surveillance. And I do believe we also have a similar model of a multidisciplinary um, craniofacial clinic in the state. I know there's one in Charleston that the CSHN program works with. I don't know if there's any others, but if anybody would like that information, I can certainly get that for them. Okay, thank you, Salem. Thank you. Um, um, oh, and I noticed someone here said, um, did you hear it took six months to finalize that survey, <laughs> or the brochure? <laughs> and yes, but you know, it was really worth it because um, the, the state is supporting us, you know, they've, they've funded for us to print out thousands of copies and like I said, it's been vetted through all of these agencies, the state agencies. So one, they're kind of aware of the need, and two, we have the ability to just get this out to the um, to all the hospitals. So it's you know it's much more powerful to disseminate it statewide than for us to try to drive all over the state handing these things out. 
Um, what I wanted to point out, my, my concern about even having the brochure, which is wonderful because a lot of times parents get stuff from the Internet that's not accurate, that's not helpful, our providers pull it off the Internet. Um, the brochure is a wonderful thing to get out to families. What our concern and our question is that we'll be watching closely this year is how does it get from that shelf in the hospital um, into the parents' hands. Um, and so, as you might have seen on that slide, same story with Down syndrome, um, it's the parents are interacting with any of, you know, all, all sorts of different healthcare providers in the hospital setting. It's not one person's job to provide the information to the parent, explain to them in, you know, a sensitive, caring way what's happening and to, to hand them that brochure. It's, that, that, that responsibility doesn't really lie with one person. And we actually surveyed providers who work in hospitals and they told us the person who's supposed to do that is the physician but then for Down syndrome. But the families told us the person who gave them the information was the nurse. So it was, it's a little bit of he said, she said. <laughs> So we'll, we'll be curious to see how that plays out, and, um, but uh, at least we've, we've developed this and I think it's a really good, a good um, product that, that will hopefully help some families out. Um, real quickly, I wanted to, you know, I noticed that you had a parent listed as an author on the project um, or as a partner on the project. And um, so in terms of, and this is for everyone, but particularly you, Dr. Marshall, in terms of this um, multidisciplinary clinic, in your opinion, how important is it for a parent representative to be involved? You've made some reference throughout your presentation, but just in general, um, to have a parent on that team. Yeah, and I think, I, I, I like to think we're moving in that direction, um, but it's been really, Slow. I mean, I know the PCORI grants, for example, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, they require that you have um, a, kind of a, a, a family or patient representative that's funded, fully funded on your proposal in order to be, to receive a grant from them. Um, so if there's some way that it's mandated within the structures, um, a lot of times it's just not built within our systems. It's not a policy. Um, but I think it's really, it's really critical and it's really helpful because, again, there are a lot of things that we, assumptions we might make or things we might not be aware of. Um, so it's helpful to get families' input kind of throughout the process. Okay. All right. Well, with that, I, again, I thank you for your time and um, sharing your experiences with us. I think there's some, uh, there are a lot of things that we could take back and, and apply to Stuff that we're doing here. So thank you, and it's nice seeing you. Ah, you too. Thank you, everyone.